Hi everyone, welcome to another of our virtual ILS NYC event broadcasts. Uh, please visit the event website to see details of our kind sponsors without who we couldn't put on this event, as well as to view all of the video content from the conference, which will be archived there for your viewing pleasure. So as we look at the development of the insurance and securities market, always with one eye into the future, this year we focus on defining the next generation of the sector. And for this broadcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Starhell, Partner and Portfolio Manager from LGT ILS Partners. Thanks for joining me, Michael. It's great to see you. So for this interview with Michael, we're going to discuss what a next generation ILS allocation strategy could look like. Um, obviously, from the viewpoint of an ILS fund manager, LGT has been in the sector for well over a decade and has a long track record um, in cross catastrophe bonds, collateralized reinsurance and other assets within the sector as well. So we're going to look at how new strategies can bring greater efficiency to the investor and manager capital as well. So I guess to begin, Michael, maybe we could just um, step back a little and you could explain the thesis of ILS investing before we begin to look forwards. Yes, indeed. So thanks for having me here. Um, I think we probably, if you talk to us, we are a very, on the one hand, you may say a conservative ILS manager, um, but more conservative in the sense that we're looking at the asset class uh, really with a, a very long-term allocation strategy. We believe that ILS should and can be a, a like a base allocation in any diversified portfolio. Most of our investors uh, are ultimately pension funds. Pension funds need to, somehow need to manage money, need to manage money in the long run. On the one hand, yes, absolutely should be return driven, but then also the downside is, is an issue and especially diversification is key. And so to your question, I think the clients that we're catering for are really looking for diversification, low correlation, and stable returns. And this may sound as like very standard answers if, if you look at ILS. I think we still have to remind ourselves that that is the key element that our, our investors, our clients are looking for. They're not necessarily looking for sort of the big bang return element. They're not after a hedge fund driven, high yielding, ultimate performer. And at the same time, we have to be careful with how we manage the asset because downside risk should be somehow protected. It should be somehow limited through a diversified approach. So it's really diversification, it's a low correlation, and it's the level of stable returns that are driving our investors, and I believe most investors, uh, into ILS as an asset class. Hmm. So the original thesis still exists. Um, do, interesting to hear your view. Do you think perhaps the perception of the need for this diversified source of returns has increased with the experience of the last year from the pandemic? I certainly believe so. Um, but although I have to say, when we look at the returns in 2020 across all asset classes, it's, it's quite astonishing mm -hmm. how the market has recovered from the pandemic. When we just look at, narrowed it down to, to the extreme weeks in, in March and April, I think ILS was really was really there to support returns. It was it did exactly do what everyone was hoping it would do in such a scenario. It did do it didn't do anything. It just uh, provided positive, stable returns. Uh, maybe not stellar returns in a year like 2020 with all what happened and later in the year, but still positive positive returns and 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 uh, a, a firm base allocation, which I believe was extremely helpful. At least that's the feedback from our investor base. Mm, yeah, I think we're, we're certainly hearing from an increasing number of investors who are new to the asset class at the moment, which bodes well for, for people like yourselves going forwards, I think, as well. Um, when you think about efficiency within your day job, um, what, what do you feel is the best way to deploy capital in search of insurance or reinsurance linked returns? Um, and I guess thinking across the various ways investors could access the industry. Well, I guess uh, this is where, in our view, it gets interesting because we believe that when we look at ILS today and all the different nuances and approaches in ILS, some fundamental elements have somehow, they, they got lost in translation and, and lost in the development. And uh, all new propositions and, and, and suggestions that, that come to the market, maybe they are missing a, a, a fundamental point. If you, as an investor, are looking to allocate into uh, event-driven in, in insurance linked like investments. Uh, you, you look for liquidity, you look for broad diversification, 
there is a very easy approach. Uh, you can buy an equity of a well-run primary insurer or a reinsurer. And that would mean you have everything you want. You have the approach to you access a, a huge firm with many specialists that have a broad access to the market, that have a very stable track record for many years, uh, and that, that offer also offer liquidity. If you, if you buy the equity piece, you obviously have daily uh, liquidity, and, and it's fundamental liquidity. And then, yes, along comes the element that, that ultimately is, in our view, the value proposition of the pure ILS uh, element. Along comes the element of market psychology and demand and supply shifts and market volatility. But I think the essence is really, if you, if you want access to a broadly diversified portfolio of insurance uh, risks, well, you should certainly start at, at, at the core of, of buying equity of a well-run primary insurer or reinsurer. And so, if I may add, then add to that, and so what is ILS all about? Why, why then even ILS? Well, again, you have the market psychology, you have all the volatilities. And so the idea is, why not just look at the event-driven piece? Why not try to carve out the pure event-driven element, uh, the pure cat risk, and try to to ultimately transfer that cat risk to capital market investors that are that should be that are able and willing to take that risk to a small degree. Uh, maybe an additional information here: our investor base. If I look at the allocation to ILS within our investor base, a typical allocation of a European pension fund. Uh, which is probably about 80% of our investor breed in European pension schemes. Um, an average allocation is somewhere between 2 and 4% into ILS. So that element is, is it's a small element and, and it can take a lot of downside risk within that small allocation. So it's really that fundamental element first, why not even just buy the equity piece? But then if you look at the pure event driven piece, this is where the ILS element comes. Mm. And it's interesting you mentioned event driven because um, obviously that's something familiar in ILS, but it's something I see popping up in a wide range of sort of investment strategies nowadays where people are looking at event driven returns um, from other assets outside of ILS, which um, perhaps suggests ILS might get increasing adoption across some of those multi strategy fund elements as well. And that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting. We've seen sort of a, a, a development in the early days when we started out. Um, the, the pure ILS manager didn't really exist at that point. It was really it, it was the, the whole concept was either structure cap bonds and sell those cap bonds directly to fixed income investors uh, or to pension funds within their fixed income allocation, uh, or when it come, becomes you know riskier and, and the allocations are a bit more, uh, I would say. Uh, challenging, then the multi-strat hedge funds were the ultimate uh, shop to go. You would you would market structures. Uh, you know, back up when I was at Swiss Re, you would market these structures to the multi-strat hedge funds, and they were big in this market. And then somehow this this breed of dedicated ILS investors came into play, and then the multi-strat. The, the there are only a few multi-strat that remained in the space uh, during a period of time. And those had dedicated ILS teams within their allocation strategy. And now sort of I, I, we all see that it's coming back. It's, it's, uh, it's probably also the search for yield that are driving these markets back to ultimately also the ILS space. And also the fact that uh, what we kept hearing over the last months, uh, there is uh, or was for a short period of time, a bit of a shortage in capacity. Pricing looks more attractive now than it looked many over the last couple of years, uh, it looks probably as attractive as it was back in 12, 14. And so it's no wonder that the multi stress are also coming back into the space. Mm, yeah, no, it's interesting how the, the cycle turns on its head again. <laughs> um, so if, if the pure insurance risk is what some of the large investors are looking for, then does that make an ILS fund structure the optimal way to allocate to the space? Well, my answer should obviously be yes. Uh, because I'm an ILS manager, but um, there are obviously certain hurdles and certain challenges. Um, so the, the whole concept, where it started out, and that's why I think it's it. it we always go back to the same challenge. If if you look at the, a well-run reinsurance company uh, with a going concern balance sheet, uh, they such a company has a lot of abilities to absorb risk and to assume risk. So I think we have to ask ourselves why why then even what is it with this risk transfer to capital market investors and it was really driven by the large reinsurance companies that were driven by uh, optimization of their own capital pool of their 
ultimately of their of their capital base and also they the companies had to meet certain regulatory requirements solvency requirements in the early days it was more rating agencies that were driving the larger insurance companies to to pass on some of that risk to other sources of capital capital market investors uh, later uh, after the new solvency regime came fully into play it was mainly solvency driven how do you meet the solvency requirements how do you optimize the solvency requirements and so capping these extreme event elements and passing those on to capital market investors uh, was obviously a, a, a good solution a perfect setup and this is where we believe ILS has has a, a very solid market place this is what ILS should be all about it should be about absorbing these extreme cash risks and now to your point so is then the fund format the optimal solution probably not uh, I think it is the optimal solution for a very small element of, of risk transfer opportunities and that's uh, the, the property cat short tail business as soon as you enter into longer tail elements uh, it, it's just a challenge why do you you have to somehow put down a value on a position on a given day and you potentially even have to offer liquidity to your investors at a certain period of time and with short-term cat i think you do know at the end of a term you do know whether there was a big cat event or not and if there was a big cat event i think it's 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 uh, easier to assess and evaluate what that cat event may uh, what impact it may have onto your portfolio with long-term business marine aviation casualty motor you you don't have that and i think it's it again renders the question so there is this there are these large reinsurance companies with their going concern balance sheet that are easily able to absorb all of that business and that can also hold on to the tail for as many years as it takes literally for decades if it takes decades um, why do you then try to transform that into almost force it into this fund structure where you at one point have to put down a value on a position and let certain investors out of the structure and potentially allow new investors into the structure at the value that is is extremely difficult to to assess and to put to, to pin down so very long-winded answer sorry for that but my point is that ILS funds are not an optimal solution but are an okay solution probably the best solution for short tail cat business for longer tail business I think a, a closed end structure potentially in the form of certainly equity private equity or potentially uh, just in the form of a plain vanilla reinsurance entity is the better solution hmm. do you think we might see a shift in future to a, a, a some kind of hybrid that supports longer tail risks a bit better and perhaps taps on certain types of investors appetite for the assets that come with the insurance float as well and I know there's been a few transactions in the market that have looked to sort of capitalize on that type of investor appetite. Um, have you got a view on that? I think the interesting point is that if we look at today's world of, of primary insurance companies and reinsurance companies, we still, we don't have the sort of the next generation insurer is, has, hasn't really been launched. And I think we're, we're sort of already now in, in the midst of this discussion about innovation, about sort of what's happening next. Uh, we do believe, and I do believe that, well, ultimately, it, what is an insurance company all about? Uh, an insurance company is a brand name that is able to source business and, and to manage a portfolio. So the next question is, okay, do they have to keep, does this insurance company have to keep all types of risk on their own balance sheet? Is this the most efficient way? And the answer is probably not. Probably it's it's really, the most efficient way is really to split up different pieces of risk and allocate that risk to those investors who want to take that specific risk. And then you can essentially invest in either the management company, which is the former primary insurer that is managing the risk, but on a, on a very sort of limited equity level on, on the, the, the equity that it needs to hold in order to meet all regulatory capital requirements based on the fact that they can pass on several layers of risk to different types of investors. And then it's really about the term uh, of, of the investment, about the focus of the investment. So you, you may structure shorter term um, fund structures, which only focus on CAT. And you may then structure longer term type of exposures that look still look at CAT elements, still look at, at event driven elements, but then really with the focus on a, a longer term casualty marine motor. 
but then we're talking 10 years and more in terms of the term that it needs to be in order to really justify uh, all and, and address all the challenges that we talked about. Sure. You, know, you mentioned earlier that um, obviously when cap bonds first came about, they were all about sort of capping the downside and buffering companies so they didn't blow through the top of their, their sort of portfolios of, of potential losses. <clears throat> I wonder if the next um, generation is finding ways to segment out pieces of the tower in different ways to different types of investors and whether that's something we're just beginning to learn about. Well, it's ultimately, it's maybe, you know that we've established our own rated carrier in order to transact business. Um, mm -hmm. We have established a Bermuda-based structure by the name of Lumen Re, which is capitalized and rated. And ultimately, this is to a certain degree what Lumen Re does. Lumen Re is the one-stop shop for all of our counterparties we're trading with. So all the primary insurance companies and the reinsurance companies that we deal with, they buy protection from Lumen Re. But Lumen Re is nothing but ultimately but a collateralized fronter, a, a very strongly capitalized fronting entity that is then, and so to your point, allocating the different transactions to different funds on the back. So at LGT, we're managing currently um, you know, five open-ended funds, but then several mandate funds, and they're all focused on a different risk and return target. So based on whatever risk and return target there is, uh, you know, that would be the home for that piece of business, and it would simply be passed on to that fund, and the fund is then collateralizing the business to Lumen Re. And if you then continue on that line of thought, right now the focus is really property care. And indeed, we may over time look at other asset classes and, and sort of business lines, not asset classes, uh, business lines as well, uh, and see if there are investors that are interested in taking that level of risk um, and, and that business line with a longer term focus. And then we can, again, transact in the same way. So ultimately, it's almost a bit of what you described, uh, although we, we are not at the source of the actual business. We're still only a reinsurance company. Mm -hmm. And I guess the the, the ultimate, uh, almost like the holy grail maybe, could be if, if it's really just a, a transacting um, company that is sourcing the risk and is then this, you know, based on certain parameters, deciding which piece of the business should stay on their own balance sheet and which part of the business should be passed on to ultimately to investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting concept, obviously, because it's there's lots of different ways that could potentially go in the future towards um, insurance companies that are capitalized on a more collateralized type basis by funds or companies like Lumen potentially that partner with origination origination sources so people who have direct access to risk that feed into you and you're the capital provider behind it um can you can you see lumen becoming sort of the hub for all of that within your business i mean it, it already is from the reinsurance point of view i guess well maybe again taking this question a bit from from a different angle how do we believe or how how it, it, this is not us. This is not LGT. I think this is just common, common sort of expectation how the market will develop. Uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to be super smart here. I'm really just reiterating what what we read and what we see. Uh, it's obvious that there's a big question mark around the big, the big tech companies, whether or not the big tech companies will and and how they will ultimately engage in in insurance business. And coming back to my premise that what is an insurance company all about? If, if you take the big, the big names, Allstate, Allianz, uh, you know, AXA, they are ultimately, they're a brand name. They're a, a brand name that typically work with their own agent network. So they're sourcing their own business. They're selling insurance policies. They also manage their own business, which we believe is vital. So they, they are controlling the loss levels. They are sending out people to assess individual losses. So they're managing both the policies, the wordings, the whole transaction structure, they're also managing the loss side uh, and, and they try to optimize their portfolio by, by generating profit, i.e. have an active selection on who you should sell insurance to, manage your, your losses actively and try to optimize and, and ultimately uh, generate high returns. In order to do that, you need a certain capital base. So the big question mark now, and that's exactly what we talked about. Okay, so if you pass on some of the business you can reduce your capital base and, and obviously then still further improve your returns. So if you look at that and, and just look at the market access, 
then we have to admit that the big tech companies already have that market access. They have a brand, they have a reputation. They know their client, probably they know their client better than, than many of the insurance companies because they know what they buy, they know where they live, they know uh, to a certain degree they're, they can almost put down a quality element if, if you then think about underwriting, risk assessment, they can probably already do a quality assessment on a certain counterparty uh, on how they would probably then develop as a client for an insurance portfolio. So I guess it's just a matter of time when the tech companies will start to explore that. And then the, the key question is, okay, and will they want to keep any of the risk or will they just ask us distribution? Then I guess they will just team up with a large prime insurance company that has all the licenses in place or will they take it to the next level? And this is where we could fit in. This is where the ILS market could fit in. Um, if if uh, the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, they, if they need a, a cover holder with licenses in every state in the US, just to start in the US, then yes, we're certainly not the right partner. If, however, they also want to cover that element, they build this up themselves and then just want to manage the actual portfolio and seek for risk takers to take out a uh, cat risk element, I guess this is where the ILS market should really be on the forefront. This is where there is then no further need to talk to insurance companies, no further need to talk to reinsurance companies. This is where we could be the real conduit. This is where the ILS market could be the ultimate solution. Mm -hmm. And it could be very attractive. It could be massively diversified. It would be instant market access. It would be shortcut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. And so, yeah, I think I think Tesla sort of came very close to trying something around that when they they looked to buy a a sort of fifty state licensed fronting company. And I know they were in talks with various people about capital sources that were outside of the traditional, should we say? Um, but it also raises interesting potential challenges in future for people who run fund operations such as yourselves, as in if you were receiving business from an entity of that scale with that rate of velocity of transactions going on, it's a, a whole new ball game when it comes to portfolio management as well. True, but then again, this would not be, I, I would not expect one single ILS manager then to then be in, in situation where you have to stomach the whole thing. I think it would be a market placement, likely there will be a broker involved and, and brokers will place that piece of business in the market. By the way, we can we can all see again, uh, reading off what's currently happening in the market. There's a big push of the large brokers to support corporates, large corporates, to access the ILS market directly, either in parametric form or potentially in UNL form over time. And it's it's sort of it's almost the same. It's brokers that are trying to circumvent insurance and reinsurance companies, trying to convince larger corporates to directly access the ILS market and buy protection from capital market investors. And we're obviously supporting this approach if if the business is 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 meeting our quality expectations, our our return expectations, our risk assessment expectations. But generally, it's uh, you know we welcome all sources of business. Uh, and I guess if Tesla, just to use that example again, were to ultimately sell uh, motor insurance directly, and 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 uh, also there's a cat element to it, which we probably would be more interested in, but the liability element I'm not so sure about. But then that uh, ultimate pool of, of 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 risks will be shown into the market. This is where this is what we want to see. This is where we'll be here for. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting development actually around some of the large sponsors that have come to the cat bond market recently, in particular obviously Google, um, and whether that. Is something we <laughs> whether that is something we see more of with um, with obviously perception of and of climate risk and exposure rising rapidly and um, I do wonder whether some of these large corporations are expecting that they're going to have capital pressure coming down the line and they now see the potential for risk transfer as a much more sort of balance sheet positive thing and um, which obviously is exactly what the RLS market was um, designed to do. Absolutely. And maybe then just to add to that. And so what the, the, the big challenge for an ILS manager now, uh, and again, nothing new under the sun, but the biggest challenge for an ILS manager has always been to match capital, incoming capital with allocations. And that challenge will remain. Uh, it, it's, it's the biggest challenge. It's, it's something that you have to really play nicely. You have to be able to work your pipeline, your investor pipeline, and, and, and be able to 
somehow match that with with uh, allocation opportunities. And so what what we really see as a big advantage here, having a rated balance sheet in between, is whilst we're not we're not keen to to lever up and 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 to run a you know highly levered portfolio, we 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 really have a strong view on, on on capital efficiency, but also on on, on on a strong rating, on a strong balance sheet. This is what we want to be. We want to be an ILS market, but still having the ability to underwrite certain business without having the full backing at this point in time, because we know it's coming, uh, helps tremendously in order to just match deal flow with actual investments that are coming into the fund. So once again, uh, having a rated balance sheet in between is, is a big help uh, in order to just continue the growth pattern and, and and allow new business to come into play mm. so, so it helps on both the underwriting and also on managing the flow of investment capital as well for you guys um so if if we're sort of going full circle and ils operating rated reinsurers is is obviously a more efficient way in your your view at lgt is this already a sign of the next generation of ils investing and allocation um, or do you feel this is a step on a on a road, um, a journey, perhaps. It, I, I think, you know, the market is. You, you you mentioned at the very beginning. We've been doing this for well over a decade now, and the market has developed rapidly. We've also mm-hmm. lived through, I wouldn't call it, uh, you know, several crises, but certainly certain certain uh, challenges. Um, you know, the financial market crisis. Um, I was already a capital manager at that time back at Clarendon, um, together with my colleagues and. 08, 09 was, was rather challenging. Then we had some of the loss heavy years, uh, you know, the Japanese earthquake events, and then uh, obviously 2017 and and now 2020 with, with uh, some uncertainties around the COVID situation. And so I think the what we're now seeing is almost like the lesson learned from, from that track that we have now gone on, that path that we have uh, walked on, we have seen that there are certain challenges, certain things that we need to improve. And we do fundamentally believe that having a rated balance sheet in between uh, is is ultimately key in order to smoothen out some of the elements. It's also key to, it, it's still interesting and, and to a certain degree a, a bit, um, how would I say, I'm still surprised about it, that many counterparties, many especially primary insurance companies, they prefer to deal with a rated balance sheet. So if you would ask them, okay, we can post collateral in the trust account, uh, or you can face our, our rated carrier and we deal with the collateral within the rated carrier, they would go for the rated carrier simply because it it releases them from a lot of also, you know, elements that they have to maintain from a regulatory point of view. They would have to ensure that the collateral is in place. They have to take a conscious decision right at the end of the period. Do we hold on to the collateral or do we let the collateral uh, do we pay back? Uh, they can sit on the collateral, which obviously leads to trapped capital, something that we is definitely undesirable. And so the rated balance sheet helps to, to, to balance it out. But then again, we also have to be very careful because, as I said at the very beginning, the reinsurance world, the reinsurance entities, it's, it's a very efficient way to transact risk. So we also have to make sure that we still keep our premise. We still we're still an ILS manager. We are. Why would you buy from an ILS manager? Well, first of all, we can take peak exposure. We we, we have a lot of capital. That's what our client wants. And certainly, many of the traditional insurance companies are are somewhat hesitant to take too much of the peak. But then again, it's it's the collateralization element. It's it's security that we can offer. Uh, we're capitalized to the one in ten thousand year event at this point. So we we would be here to pay every single loss that could occur. And we still have people working, managing claims, uh, and, and no one will shut the light. And so that element is, is key, and we certainly want to keep that. And, and I guess the last 10 years, we try to learn, we try to evolve. And so the next 10 years will be much more of that. It, it will be probably accelerated. It, it will go much faster. But I do think that we'll see fundamental changes in how risk is being transacted. That's a really great point about um, the collateralization and how that gives you this capital worthiness that could see you through um, events that would decimate parts of the traditional market um, because of their capital models. Um, very interesting point. 
So, Michael, that we're coming up on the half hour, so um, I really thank you for your time. Uh, that was a really interesting discussion and great to hear from you. Um, really good thoughts there on where the ILS market could be going next. Um, so, all I'll say is thank you for your time today and um, I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much for having me.